Big round of applause for Scott, please. All right, am I good to go? Let's start it. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Scott Weiss, I'm from EMC, and this is um, by my project called Unique. Um, it's a project for uh, managing, building, deploying unikernels. Um, so let's get to it. Um, first, I just want to tell you about my team. Um, it's, uh, the whole project was just developed by myself, uh, another engineer named Yuval, um, under the leadership of AD, who was supposed to be here, but couldn't be. Um, we do a lot of open source stuff. Um, some of the stuff isn't actually open yet. Getting that through the pipeline at EMC is a slow process, but we've got a lot of interesting projects, so you should check out our GitHub org um, at that address. It's got the code for Unique, and it'll have more stuff in the near future. Um, okay, so let's talk about why the motivation why we did this project. Um, so if you take a look at this uh, stack right now, what you're looking at is the um, stack that the modern PaaS, modern Docker infrastructure um, is employing in order to run applications. So inside of this you've got hardware, top of that you've got your hardware drivers. Um, usually you have a hypervisor running on that and any kind of data center or cloud. Um, the hypervisor is your, your host OS. Um, then on top of that um, it's serving virtual machines. So those virtual machines have, each have their own operating system. Um, in the operating system, on top of that, you're running user processes. One of those is Docker. So Docker is running on your system. Docker creates this Docker runtime. Um, then in Docker has a, sort of this isolation going on for processes. Each one has its own file system. In those file systems, you've got language runtime, uh, shared libraries, and then the application itself, as well as the config. So basically everything we've been talking about at this conference this is the stack that, that's being replicated in all these, whether it's Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, um, you know, Amazon Cloud, what have you. Um, so anyway, we took a look at the stack and we tried to understand what's the purpose? Why have all this stuff? And what, what we're doing now in the cloud is we're seeking to run a single application with a single user on a single server. And we said, what, what is this stack giving us in order to accomplish that? Well, it's giving us a lot of redundancy, for sure. So if we look at, at what's actually going on here, we'll see that there's a lot of isolation on the hardware level, right? We're talking about lots and lots of nodes, physical nodes that are clustered together in a data center. Um, so they're physically isolated from each other. Um, then you've got the hypervisor, right? Hypervisor is virtual, is emulating hardware. So every OS that's running on a hypervisor is isolated, just gets its own uh, virtual network card, virtual file system, etc. Then uh, OS itself is doing isolation. There's lots of isolation going on in the OS, especially with things like SE Linux and SE Comp, um, where processes are protected from one another, processes are protected from the kernel itself. Um, now, since we're all mostly running Docker, more or less, Docker is also doing levels of isolation. Um, and then applications themselves very often are isolating clients from each other, or isolating itself from itself. Um, so we have a lot of redundancy going on in the stack. Um, and isolation is just one example of that. Um, now taking a look at the Linux kernel, which is sort of the universal bible of how we run containers today. Pretty much nobody's running them on anything but Linux. Um, take a look at this, the, the Linux kernel and we understand that there's a lot of complexity going on in the kernel itself. It's, doing a lot of isolation. Um, app, uh, applications are protected from each other, users are protected from each other, and the kernel is protected from everything. There's this uh, pri privilege checking going on, there's like a user mode, kernel mode, um, all sorts of safeguards put in in order to protect things that are running in a shared environment. Um, but uh, it, this really leads to a lot of inefficiency because we, we really no longer need this model. Um, and it causes lots of uh, permission checks going on. There's constantly every, every system call that an application needs to make. Uh, Linux is doing a permission check on it, seeing if it's a, this is a user application, kernel application, does it have the proper permissions to read this file, proper permissions to write to a WebSocket. Um, furthermore, we've got like uh, a lot of the things that, that Linux provided us that our applications kind of used to expect, don't anymore. For example, you know the Etsy, directory that's in basically every Unix file system. It contains configuration for the local system, but we're getting away from that now. Now we're using things like etcd and console for configuration, and there's this sort of cruft that's left over from Linux from an older age that we don't really need anymore. 
further. You know, Linux, Linux is it's, it's really built to run on anything and to be able to run anything. So in your Linux instances on, on AWS, you've got floppy drivers, USB drivers, drivers to run on a variety of different kinds of hardware, even though you don't need that. So this is additional code, additional opportunities for bugs, and additional opportunities for um, exploits. Um, and further, when you're doing all the, the configuration management of the, the host system itself, you're bringing a lot onto the system that you may not necessarily want. You do yum install, apt get, and you're, you're bringing on tons and tons of libraries and binaries when you may only want one. Um, so this obviously has big implications for security. <coughs> uh, Linux typically is it's like a big target for attackers. If you find a vulnerability in Linux, in, in you know, Linux itself, it means that so many different application servers out there are compromised because they're all running Linux. So it's like this common big surface of attack. Um, uh, a, a lot of exploits out there actually specifically target um, Linux. Um, also in the, in the uh, container ecosystem, containers are sharing the host. So you have containers running on a virtual machine. They're not really isolated from each other. They're really accessing, they're all accessing the same file system. They're all accessing the same hardware. So if you've got like a virtual network card attached to your virtual machine, and you have a bunch of containers that are accessing that network card, they're all sharing the same one. So if one container is compromised, that means all your other containers are now subject to attack or, or um, denial of service from that one container. Um, looking further into the complexity of Linux, you see all these like tons of languages that make up the kernel. Um, <coughs> Linux kernel itself is 22 million lines of code. Um, and then your standard liber uh, Linux uh, Debian distribution is 419 million lines of code. It's a tremendous amount of complexity going on here, um, all in order to run this, right? My really beautiful uh, JavaScript server, the microservice cloud native. Um, so concerning like, how, how do we actually get to this? Why do we have, we're running like single server applications, um, single application servers on this giant complex beast of an operating system, how do we get here? Well, Linux based on Unix, which was developed for the mainframe era, right, when computers were really expensive. And so there was a time sharing model that was employed where developers, engineers had to share one giant computer. So that it was really necessary to enforce all of this isolation at the OS level. Um, and it's just, this, follow this all the way here, my Android phone is running a Unix based operating system. Um, so, you know, the, Supporting backwards compatibility for all these years led us to being able to run Linux on anything and be able to, being able to run anything on Linux, which is nice in terms of compatibility, but we make some tremendous sacrifices in terms of efficiency um, and security. So taking a look at this model, our team said, okay, so we have something that works. We have a working model for deploying applications, but maybe it's not built right, and it's certainly not built fast. So What's a, what's a possible solution here? And this is when we started looking at unikernels. Um, so what are unikernels? Uh, unikernel is an application that has all the operating system components it needs in order to run baked into it, into a single binary that contains both application source code, uh, hardware drivers, and system libraries, language runtime that are specific to that application in order to run, nothing more. So it's, it's a bootable image that is the application and what the application needs to run. So in order to explain further, the traditional approach is we have an application binary or you know, set of scripts um, that's sitting on top of a general OS. And general OS has a ton of libraries on top of it and then you have the OS kernel which is responsible for scheduling, memory isolation, all sorts of low level operations. And then under that you have the drivers which link it to the hardware. The unikernel approach says, okay, we'll take that same application, but we're only going to take the minimal subset of the actual things that we need from the underlying system in order to actually run it. So what we wind up with is a much smaller image that can run directly on hardware without this need for a general operating system to manage lots of them. Uh, unikernels come with a, a set of interesting limitations that can be considered as features. A unikernel can only one run prop run one process. This is like as true of a definition of a microservice as you can get. You cannot run a multi-binary, multi-process monolith inside of a unikernel. It won't work. By design, unikernels can only run a single process. 
So what happens is when the unikernel starts, all memory is mapped to the single process, which gives a huge boost in, order, in, in efficiency and boot time because there's no need for the OS to allocate virtual addresses for every single process it's running. There's no context switching going on, which means addresses never have to be cached in registers and loaded in and loaded out. The, the one process that starts at boot time is the process that gets 100% ownership of all the resources on the system. Um, there's also no permission checks that have to go on. Since the unikernel, the, the kernel itself is the only process running, there's nothing to protect from the kernel. Right? The application is the kernel. Um, make a unikernel. It's pretty simple. Um, you take application source code, config, dependencies, bundle them together with a runtime and the drivers that you need and you produce a single, small, lightweight, bootable image. Um, here's an example of a uh, unikernel that we employ in our project called Rump Run, and it's really very simple the way it works. Um, you give it a platform, uh, a target, so this is built for x86-64. <coughs> uh, it'll run on um, Verdio drivers, Verdio network drivers, which are common to like QMU, uh, VirtualBox, VMware. Um, and this, this will produce, so you can see it's like a modified version of GCC. You put in some C source code and it's not going to spit out an ELF binary that you can run. It will actually spit out a bootable image that you can then boot with QMU or VirtualBox or Hypervisor. Um, so comparing what the actual Unikernel stack looks like versus the Docker stack, over here we've got all this tremendous amount of complexity compared to um, a very small amount of complexity going on on the Unikernel stack. A unikernel is basically the bare minimum of what you need to run a single application, which in the end is what we want. Um, the benefits really that, that I see as a developer, especially, are um, there's so much less to reason about. It's so much easier to debug my system. If I have an application that's failing in the cloud somewhere, I've got um, a giant kernel and all of the many binaries that exist on it, all the libraries, OpenSSL, it could be something that's totally unrelated to my, my application that's causing a bug. I don't even know about it because I have so much to reason through in the debugging process. But with a unikernel, everything above the hypervisor level, which most developers never even see anyway, is completely within my application, debuggable at the source level, which is nice. Um, so again, minimal la uh, layers of isolation means more optimization. We're throwing away the unnecessary cruft. Um, less code equals fewer bugs. It's easier to reason about the problems that go on. Um, also, having source level control of the OS means that we can actually custom tier our unikernel, uh, the kernel implementation for the application. So if I have a, uh, an application that's a high compute need, and I have a special model, a model of how I want threading to occur, I want to throw away that, that Linux scheduler, which is designed for any kind of process, and I want to develop a special thread scheduler that's oriented for my specific application, I can do that in a unikernel, because I have source level control over the whole system. Um, so again, just going over some of the uh, other advantages of unikernels. One of the interesting ones is every unikernel is different. Since they're custom built, just because one unikernel may have an attack vulnerability, it doesn't mean other unikernels share that same vulnerability. Where with Linux, that's not true. Um, just to uh, give a little bit of background on unikernels themselves, there are different kinds of implementations. So um, they basically fall into two camps. One camp is the POSIX compatible. Uh, or positive compliant unikernel. And it's basically a unikernel that seeks to reverse engineer what um, like a Unix system does, you know, emulating this POSIX interface so that you can run C application, Java, Python, whatever you're used to, any kind of standard library that's out there. Um, it emulates all the system calls, it implements all the system calls that um, a regular operating system that you're used to implements so that you can easily port an application and run it in the unikernel just like it's, it's very easy to run your application on Linux or in a container right now. Uh, and then you've got um, the sort of bottom-up unikernels or language-specific unikernels which um, throw away standard library that you're used to and, and really themselves are just a set of libraries that you yourself manually call when you write your application, you import those libraries instead of like the standard library, and they don't use POSIX. You'll, you'll write your application in a different way. So if your application needs a TCP stack, you say import net slash TCP. If, if your application needs a file system, you import their file IO, 
And that's how, when, at compile time, the compiler is able to determine what your application actually needs to run. Okay, so I raced through that because I wanted to make sure I got to my demos um, and uh, questions. So anyway, what did we actually build? Because unikernels have been around for a while, not, not as long as containers, but um, there's, there's a community around them. So what is uh, our contribution, my group? Um, what we saw is really lacking in the space was sort of one central tool that made it really easy to run unikernels. In a similar way that Docker um, brought containers into the mainstream and said, here's, here's an easy way that anybody, you know, your grandma can now run containers on Linux. We wanted to provide the same ease of use and developer experience in the unikernel world. Um, so it's a Docker-inspired CLI tool. You'll see a lot of the same commands with this thing that you see with Docker. It's a very similar architecture. Um, but instead of running, you know, a container directly on your system, instead it's going to build Unikernel. So Unikernel is compiled, where container is a little different. Container is really just a file system, so you can sort of build it in layers. Um, Unikernel is better to think of as a binary. So you have one go, compile it. It's really like a immutable infrastructure, like truly immutable, right? There's, you, can't, you can't go and modify a binary once it's been built. You've got to go recompile it. Um, so it compiles binaries locally, and then it will deploy them on a hypervisor of your choice. So that can be like a local one, like KVM, if you're on Linux, or it'll run it on, on the cloud, run it directly on Amazon, turn it into a, a virtual machine, or run it on um, virtual box and, and uh, a variety of others. So workflow is basically unique build, unique run, and you, you spit out a virtual machine right away. So let me get right to my demo. Um, I've got a few in here, and I would like to do all three of them. So let me start out with the, with the simplest one. So um, anybody like Go here, Node, Java? I can, I can run it and show any of these for you. We support a number of languages. Run. It runs. It runs. See, it's running. Okay. Um, but let's, let's make a unicorn out of this instead. So unique build. Give it the path to the source. The whole directory. Um, and I have to give it the base, which is rump. It's the, the name of that uh, the unikernel I mentioned before. The language is Go, and the um, uh, provider is going to be VirtualBox. Uh, let's name it um, Software Circus. Uh, now, in the background, we've got this daemon process running, just like the, the Docker daemon. Um, also, you know, it, it's like a persistent process, runs in the background, and it handles concurrent requests, things like that. It keeps a, a little state of the, the system under the hood. So what it's doing right now is it's using this um, special compiler, this little um, x86-64 rump run GCC. And okay, it already built the image, so you need run. should run it, okay, and in about a second we should get an IP, because these things boot very fast. Okay, there it is, I can click on it, open it up in the browser, it's on 8080, and the beautiful website that I didn't make is being hosted in a unikernel. And if I show you what this thing actually looks like on the inside, um, the boot process for this thing, if I restart it, the virtual machine that's only running one single application. Uh, Bootstrap's hardware, uh, gets an IP from DHCP, and then we're already in the main of our application. So yeah, that is demo one. Um, uh, so that's sort of the, the basic means of running a unikernel, but um, we wanted to prove out some of the use cases for unikernel. Oh, let me talk about for a second about this. So the design of Unique itself is uh, is really modular. We're employing Go's uh, nice interface design there. So everything inside of Unique is an interface. We're really encouraging uh, community contributions. So support for OpenStack is actually open as a pull request right now. Um, one of the unikernels we support in OS was just recently contributed by a community. So um, Unique, it's not really opinionated about what kind of infrastructure it runs on, what kind of unikernel it runs. So the unikernels themselves are infrastructure specific, but uh, Unique itself is not. And Unique is really like a central platform that you can go to without any sort of unikernel pre-knowledge and, and get started right away. Um, so we wanted to show, oh, I should maximize this, I guess. Um, 
we wanted to show use case for unikernels, right? Because it's sure it's nice to run them on your laptop, but what, what can you actually use them for? So uh, we wanted to demonstrate orchestration, orchestration level with unikernels, and we didn't want to build it directly into unique. So um, we made a unikernel runtime for Cloud Foundry, uh, which is a popular platform as a service. It's an EMC product, so it wasn't hard to make that choice for us. Um, and basically, we've got Cloud Foundry, instead of running containers, it's now running unikernels on a backend. So I would actually like to show that to you now. I think the next slide is a demo, yeah. Okay, so um, I have a little application here. I'm just going to say CF push. Is anybody here familiar with Cloud Foundry at all? Ever done a CF push? All right, so. Announce the increase. Yes, yes, yeah. So I'm just doing CF. This is like the, the regular. Uh, CF command line, do CF apps. It's actually, I'm targeted right now, the like uh, Pivotal demo environment that's free to make an account on. So this works with any version of Cloud Foundry. So I'm going to say CF push. I'm going to use a custom build pack. It's our unikernel build pack. Um, here we go. It's uh, uploading the application. It takes about a minute. can actually go and look at my Amazon account because so this is using Amazon as a backend. We need somewhere that can be reached by the internet and my laptop won't work. So um, kill two birds with one stone. You guys can see a unikernel running natively on Amazon with no OS. Um, so it'll run as a virtual machine. The smallest one that Amazon supports, which is like a half a gigabyte, um, it's actually much larger than you typically want for a unikernel. Like I can show you the, the boot disk for this um, uh, the software circus unikernel I just showed you is 55 megabytes. Now compare that to Linux plus Docker plus your container that you normally need in order to run um, this binary in your, your typical stack. All right, so we finished uploading and we've got this little uh, Asteroids application here running in the cloud. Uh, deployed by Cloud Foundry, I can scale it up, scale it down. Let me hit refresh here. And so we see we actually have a virtual machine provision on Amazon. It's got its own IP. It's, it's got all the, the maturity of a virtual machines. So we've got persistence. We've got overlay networking. We don't have to worry about you know, um, all of these shared kernel vulnerabilities of Docker. I've got my application that's um, running natively directly on a hypervisor which is um, pretty neat. The last feature I wanted to demo for you guys, oh yeah, you can see it here on their UI. Um, <clears throat> anyway, uh, the last feature I wanted to demo is, you know, we're really Docker inspired and we wanted to make something that, that feels so much like Docker. So we made a unique hub, which is um, similar to Docker hub. So you can compile unikernels, push them to the cloud, and then other people can pull them and share them. <laughs> Um, so I was going to show like live pulling one for you guys, but I don't want to do that because it's still, you know, network and stuff. Um, I can do a search. It will show all the available unikernels. And as you can see, my, I, I uploaded one called Minecraft. We built a Minecraft unikernel. So it's running Minecraft natively on hypervisor, no OS. Um, and let's run an instance of Minecraft right now. Needs a little bit more memory because it's, it's Java and it's Minecraft. And I can actually show you guys. Let's watch it boot. It's Minecraft itself. Let's hit play. Let's run a unique PS and get the IP. Time. Oh, dot ten. Okay. So let's direct connect to this server here. And will it work? Demo gods, please. Let's see how if it's actually um, finished bootstrapping. Yeah, the server. 
Okay. There we go. And we're in the game. Minecraft hosted on the Unity Pro. All right. Well, I finished pretty fast. Thank you guys. Um, I'm sure people have questions. <laughs> yeah, I better seek shelter. In Docker, you can inject by example secrets. How would you do this in the Unicorn? Um, so, as far as configuration management, um, there a lot of the tooling that exists around Docker right now is there because Docker built a really um, lively, interested community with something that originally had really no things like secret management orchestration. Um, our means of doing that right now, we basically have, um, at runtime, you can inject environment variables into instances, um, just sort of like a really basic um, means of doing that. But things like orchestration, monitoring, debugging, uh, there are some tools available for doing that with Unikernels, and that's one of the aims of our project, is to expand that set of tools. But again, it's, it's not on the level that you have with like Linux, which has 20 years of history, or you know Docker, which has you know, three or four years um, of like widespread adoption, so. Uh, yeah. But you you can do secret management right now as a as a simple way to do it, or um, environment variables for configuration. Uh, Any more no, questions? Something. Regarding security vulnerabilities, so in the Linux we're used to it that uh, somebody discovers a bug, you have to patch uh, OpenSSH, you have to patch it, you patch it, it's be stuck. So you yeah. mentioned it's one of the advantages that every application is different, each one is a different attack surface, but. It sounds like a real nightmare to maintain. You have to know exactly what vulnerabilities are available, which one you need to patch. You have to wait for the unicorn to patch it. How do you maintain that? Uh, so, I mean, if it's like an OpenSSL vulnerability, for example, if your unicorn uses OpenSSL, then it's, it's OpenSSL. My, my point about the custom attack surface before is that if your application isn't using OpenSSL, then the vulnerability isn't there. It's not like it's there just because you have this general OS. Uh, that has the vulnerability, you know, the OS is exposed to the internet, um, and therefore if the OS has some library that can be exploited, it's got some shell code, you know, vulnerability that's there, um, it won't be there necessarily in the Unicorn. But Unicorns can still share common interfaces, uh, especially Rump, for example. Rump Run is based on NetBSD. So all the um, system components are actually taken piece by piece out of NetBSD, including drivers, system libraries, um, and generally anything that will cross-compile to NetBSD will run as a rump run unikernel. Um, the difference being that, that your attack surface is it's customized for the needs of the application. Um, but it's true that um, you know, if you want to update, there's no, there's no like hot update for a unikernel, right? It's, it is immutable infrastructure, and that's the trade-off that you get. So if you want to patch your unikernel, well, build a new one and delete the old one. But, you know, again, it's this small uh, atomic unit. It's not like we have to worry, oh, we're going to lose all our applications. It's, it's one application, right? So, um. Any more? Uh, it's actually really great stuff. It's the first time I hear about it, and uh, I'm very impressed. Uh, but uh, I'm uh, curious about uh, use cases. Uh, let, let's say, uh, can it run different kinds of applications? Let's say GitLab, it, uh, if you install it, it runs uh, uh, Redis, Nginx, and some other stuff. Is it suitable for that? Or? Uh, absolutely. You can run um, Nginx, Redis. Um, in fact, a lot of things that aren't good use cases for containers, because containers don't have strong support for things like persistence and networking. So your database is a great example. Um, you can run as a unikernel and you'll, you'll see a optimization performance of memory, of, of processing. Um, so one use case is to sort of take the load that containers can't run and it can run that. Also the things that you run in containers, I mean it depends on the actual application. Um, I was explaining to somebody before that uh, because a unikernel is single process, going deep this means that um, Fork, if you guys know fork and exec system calls, which spawn another process, it's like whenever, like a shell, for example, shell and I, I do PS here, I just made another process, right? You cannot do that on a unikernel. Unikernels actually don't have the option for that, so there's no shell at all in a unikernel. There's no SSH, there's no shell, no terminal. Um, any kind of exploit that tries to execute another program will not work. Um, so it's, it's like it's a, it's a feature, but it's a limitation, so it's really sort of natively designed for um, microservice. Um, but as far as use cases, there have been a number of, of proofs. I mean, um, uh, IoT devices 
I really wish my uh, my boss had been able to be here because um, she's got the um, the Raspberry Pi. So we actually have a uh, unikernel loaded directly on metal, and this is one of the cool use cases for unikernels. They don't only run on the cloud; you can run them on metal as well. Um, so we've got a Raspberry Pi that we hook up to a toaster, and it, you know uh, you can power it on with your phone, and it, it goes and it'll make a penny for you. <laughs> <laughs> but so IoT devices are a great use case for unikernels. Uh, some unikernels have an extremely fast boot time. Uh, so I actually mentioned in, in the previous session that things like the, the serverless architecture or functions as a service because they boot so quickly, um, you can actually very easily scale out some kind of lambda-like service that's based on unikernels. Um, uh, one of the one of the big advantages I see to unikernels is if you think about your data center right now. You want to be able to scale really quickly up and down. Um, so if you're scaling containers, um, containers sort of need uh, virtual machines as their bucket, right? Unless you're running containers on bare metal, which I, you know, I challenge you to find a cloud that will ever do that, at least a, a public cloud. Um, so you sort of need, when you reach the, the capacity that you have for virtual machines, you've got to build more virtual machines in order to fit more containers. And when you scale down your containers, you want to delete your virtual machines. This is this extra layer that's like a bottleneck for scaling your cluster. Well, you're scaling virtual machines, you're scaling uh, applications directly on a hypervisor now. And the hypervisor is just there, it's available. If you're running a Google Cloud, I mean everything that you, every instance you launch is directly on the hypervisor. So it's not like you're paying for more than what you're using, it's not like you have this long delay in creating more instances so that we can scale up and down our cluster. That would be like another, another use case. It's more fine-grained control over uh, resource consumption. One more question, somebody? I think you were just first, but maybe we'll stretch it to two questions. So I heard about uh, unikernels from EraserOS, and they also stressed the importance of using functional languages, like Haskell I think they use, mm -hmm. because that's also much more secure from a programming perspective. Maybe you could comment on that, and also comment on their, uh, they were bought by uh, yeah, Docker, sure. And uh, I didn't see Docker on your image where you would unique words appropriate with, uh, so maybe comment on that. Sure. Uh, okay, so uh, Mirage OS is one of the language specific unikernel implementations I was talking about before. So if you want to build a Mirage unikernel, uh, it's, it's actually OCaml, which is also a functional language yeah. uh, that is written. You write your application in OCaml and instead of using like the OCaml standard library, use their set of libraries in order to build your application. Um, I, positives I could say about Mirage, it's very, very fast, extremely fast. Um, it's optimized for running on the Zen hypervisor, which is, includes uh, VMware, AWS. Um, you can run it natively on Linux, um, or as an OS with Zen server. Um, uh, Mirage, it's very powerful. And as far as like functional languages, like what's better to develop in, honestly, I mean, I'm Go, I'm a huge lover of Go. Go is like a partially functional language, but it's, it's not, you know, it doesn't have pure functions. It doesn't have like a lot of the things that Mirage has. Um, I, I see a problem with, with uh, I, I think that the, the POSIX compliant unikernels will be the ones that eventually win this market um, because they don't require developers to learn a whole new way of writing. I mean, right now we see the shift with microservices where developers are having to learn a different architecture for writing code. But at least they still get to write the same code. They can use the same language. They can use the same standard library. I mean, telling people to divorce from standard library, uh, I think it's it's great for certain use cases, for like um, high security needs, for um, like very hardware specific unikernels. Um, I could definitely see applications where, where companies would want to run um, uh, Mirage unikernel. But I see a unikernel like Rump being more applicable, especially for cloud use case for you know the things that people are using Docker containers for. All right. Can, um, can I just respond? Oh sure. Um, how do you go about debugging crashes? Okay, so um, like I said, a lot of the tooling that we we the sophisticated tooling that we have around um, Linux um, and now Docker as well over the past few years um, gives us a lot of uh, tooling for debugging. You know, Netstat, um, ifconfig, etc. Um, it gives us a lot, a lot of uh, ability to, to debug. It's not as readily available yet in the unikernel space. Uh, Rump Run, the Rump unikernel does have um, a set of utilities. 
So you basically you point it at the unikernel, um, and you can uh, connect over uh, over the network and sort of remotely debug. Um, another way that you can debug, and this is really my favorite way, is um, you get source level debugging with GDB. So I actually probably have a minute I can show that to you. Um, it's one of the nice things that Unique offers. Uh, see if I can do. Um, I think I have to build. Um, a, a, so I'll run it. I'll run an image with QMU, and I can actually attach a debugger to that image and step through it line by line. And I mean, in my opinion, there's no stronger way to debug because I can actually see every line of code from the the system level code, the drivers, all the way into my application. So it's like this one single binary that contains everything I need to know about my application. Um, so when the debugging and the tooling actually does get there, um, just change this to QMU. Uh, Unikernels will actually be arguably much easier to debug. But again, just a lot of the tooling isn't there right now. Is that it? Any other? Are there any other questions? We do actually have time. Is that a yawn or a <laughs> Josh? Don't do that at an auction, man. You buy something you don't want. <laughs> yes? Okay, last question then. Hi there. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Very interesting. I'm a bit of a newbie. I just came on to learn about uni, uni kernels. So they were very interesting. Any recommendations about how to learn more? Good resources? I mean, this is impressive. I'll come. Hopefully, your presentation is online. Sure. I can't see this. Sorry, in the call. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I actually think that Unique is great for this because it's, it's sort of designed to be like a, a black box for, I want to write a Unikernel, I have no idea how to get started. Um, so it lets you play with it. If you want to learn more about how they actually work, um, you should check out unikernels.org. They have a, well, that's maintained by the Mirage people. Um, they have a white paper on the essentials of Unikernels, why they're built this way, um, benefits and, and architecturally how they're working. Uh, and also the, the creator of the rump kernel, um, this very uh, eccentric guy named Antti Kanti, um, just wrote a uh, textbook actually on his implementation of rump kernel, um, how it works. He's a, he's a former NetBSD developer and um, he sort of explains the reasoning, justification, and architecture. Um, in, in a way, I mean, it's, it's complex terminology, but you'll be able to understand the book even if you've never done systems level programming before. So I would search for the. You give it, give it me after, and I'll, I'll help you yeah. locate that resource. Thank you very much. Sure. Okay, that's all we've got time for. Let's give one more big round of applause for Scott. Woo